So good afternoon again, everybody. I'm Francesca Spiraglieri. I'm the Senior Fellow for Cyber Leadership at the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our first virtual event on cybersecurity for this academic year. Thank you all for joining us remotely. As I was saying earlier, I wish we could all be together in person to discuss some of the incredible opportunities available in the cybersecurity field to all of you, but also some of the challenges that we are all experiencing as we transition almost every aspect of our lives to the digital space. I think this is actually a great time to be in cybersecurity. First of all, because there is technically zero unemployment in this sector, but also because what better purpose is there that to help your family, your friends, your community, your organization um, to you know, deal with some of the most persistent and dangerous threats in the modern age, whether it's identity theft, data breaches, ransomware attacks to schools and hospitals, to online disinformation and election interference. I really truly believe that working in cybersecurity means having a real impact on the lives of thousands of people by working towards a safer and more secure cyberspace for everyone. So to help me discuss some of the most exciting career paths in cybersecurity and educational opportunities at Salve and elsewhere, certification for government private sector jobs, but also networking and mentorship opportunity, I have a stellar panel today and I couldn't be more excited. So before I introduce my fellow panelists, I want to remind you all that uh, we want to answer your questions as well. So please feel free to send to your questions. I will read them and try to address all of them throughout the panel or definitely at the end of it. And so now, without further ado, I want to welcome my friends and colleagues on this panel. First of all, Professor Barrett Wan, he's an adjunct faculty member at Salve, teaching cybersecurity and intelligence courses. He's also DIA account executive at Kaki International. We also have Juliana Sandonato. He's a, she is a senior software engineer at Raytheon and one of my former students. And Darwin Salazar, he's a senior product security analyst at Johnson & Johnson and he was my very first intern at the Bell Center. Bell Center. So I'm so. thrilled to have all of you here this afternoon and thank you again for joining us. I hope our stories will inspire you and will leave you with some tips and recommendations to get you excited about a career in cybersecurity, hopefully. So since today I serve both as a speaker and as the moderator on the panel, I want to use my five, six minutes uh, of introduction to demystify some of the common myths that, um, in cybersecurity careers that I've heard from my students and I've experienced myself as I was entering this field. I have been fortunate enough to have a great career so far, but most of it was actually unexpected and unplanned. And unlike you today, there were no programs in cyberspace policy or management of cyber risk when I was in college or even in grad school. I didn't start my studies or even my career thinking that I would be focusing on cybersecurity. And so here's the myth number one that I hear most often, that cybersecurity is a domain for the nerds and the, a computer science is, degree is a must. And now with all due respect for Juliana, who does hold one, I think this is certainly the way we thought about the internet at least until the early 90s. But then we all start using the internet and depending on it. And now we do know that cybersecurity is a national security problem, is a safety and security problem, is a business operations problem, is a human psychology problem, is a legal and regulatory problem. And while having a background in IT and computer science, it's certainly helpful. A successful career in cybersecurity does not depend on it. Each of us, in fact, in whatever role you might play in life and in your organization does make decisions about cybersecurity almost every day. And those decisions will shape the future beyond the world of computers. I personally, always, I was always drawn to science, technology in school. But it was mostly about what technology can help me better connect with my friends and family. How can I simplify some of the tasks? When I first came to the United States as an exchange student at 17, I used Skype to communicate with my family through a very slow DLS, DS, DSSL connection. At the time, there was no Zoom or WebEx. Uh, we struggled and still I could see the power of technology. 
At the time also, I wanted to be a diplomat. Cybersecurity was not even in the back of my mind. I wanted to change the world. I did everything that you can expect um, from somebody who wants to pursue a career in diplomacy. I studied political science, international affairs, public international law. I learned four different languages. I studied in um, Italy, in France, the United States, Spain. I participate and taught several model United Nations simulations. For those of you who don't know, think of them as capture the flag or other cybersecurity war games. So cybersecurity wasn't exactly part of this experience. But I learned a great deal about international relations, security, geopolitical issues. And at that time, this is not new of 2020, there were already a lot of strategic and multidimensional power struggles going on between large cyber powers. Countries like the United States, China, Russia were already using cyber tools and their capabilities to project power, to influence global politics, to impose their own interests to conduct cyber operations in and through cyberspace. And so those things definitely trickled my mind and got me really interested about this, the field. I knew that cybersecurity and the internet would be shaping geopolitics and security for the future. And this is what really got me into cybersecurity. But what most fascinated me was this wide spectrum of field that one could pursue without ever leaving the sector. You could be in cryptography and mathematics. You could be in computer science, in law and privacy, in national security and international relations like me, in legal compliance, regulation. All of these fields are tightly glued together by technology. And so it was actually through a lot of the experience I had before I even started studying cybersecurity in grad school and afterwards um, that I also learned a lot of the skills that have become really useful today whether it's public speaking, debating, writing skills, critical thinking, teamwork, leadership skills, all of these are just as important as that degree that you will put on your resume in this field where we need a diverse background and different way to think about problems to solve such complex issues as cybersecurity. So this brings me to the myth number two that I often hear that there needs to be a job opening for me to apply before I can even consider reaching out to that dream company, dream organization. There was no job opening for me at the Pell Center back way when I started, but I was able to get an informational interview with the executive director at the time, who's still Dr. Jim Ludis. He was also new at the time and was looking for new ideas. He wanted to revamp the center and the research project. And cybersecurity was appealing. Um, I guess I made a good impression. And from there, my position was created as uh, back then a fellow for cyber security, turning to now the senior fellow for cyber leadership. And it's here at the Pell Center that I started focusing more on the ways that cyberspace and the internet in particular were changing our way of life revolutionizing the way we communicate, we work, we participate in the social contract, contributing to the digital economy, but also threatening our national security and economic well-being. And so here comes my third myth that I often saw in the community I started engaging with through the Pell Center, that cybersecurity is just a technical issue that requires technical solution. We all know that this is definitely not the case in 2020. One of the most important aspects of all my studies in this field, in fact, is this notion that senior leaders across society can no longer treat cybersecurity as an isolated IT problem best left to the IT department. Cybersecurity needs to be integrated front and center into organization decision-making processes and the risk management agenda of every organization. And you can all help with this. I believe strongly that cybersecurity belongs to the boardroom of every company, as well as the situation room in the White House and other governments. And it's this strong belief that turned at the Pell Center into what we call the Cyber Leadership Program. And we continue through this initiative to provide top leadership, in-depth research, policy recommendations, all related to cybersecurity. My research and lectures around the world continue to focus at, in that intersection between technology, policy, security, law, risk governance, 
And through all of my studies and speaking engagements, unfortunately not in person, but mostly now online, what I try to do, whether I'm being a professor at Salve in one of my classes or a consultant for Hathaway Global Strategy, which is my daily job, or as an advisor to our governor, our congressional delegation and other senior leaders, what we're trying to communicate is cybersecurity has to very much to do with the economy policy, regulation, and every leader in the modern age has to have at least a basic understanding of the cyber ecosystem in which they operate and need to figure out common solutions to solve some of the problems that we'll be discussing in part today. So I think you've heard enough about me. So I wanted to uh, move on to Professor Wan. Um, and please let us know how did you get into cybersecurity? What actually made you interested in this field? Um, and how does cybersecurity actually fit in what you have done and continue to do in government, academia, and the private sector, since you are the one that has the, breadth, the biggest breadth of experience? Thank you. Francesca, first I want to thank you for putting this together. This is a wonderful opportunity. Um, with the classes that I have the uh, the privilege of teaching at Salve, I only reach a certain amount of students. So this this gives us the chance to at least start the dialogue, pushing it out to a larger audience. So I want to thank you for putting it together, and for my two other panelists on there, I really look forward to this discussion. My uh, my falling into cyber was almost accidental. So. Let me start off with, with my eclectic background without going into lengthy detail, just kind of an itemized list. It started off as a staffer on the Hill, just running around stapling and collating, but then writing down that I did everything in the world to solve world peace. But needless to say, that was, uh, was what I did running around the Senate Dirksen building. Uh, then I moved into NSA, was there for about a decade, and then lateral to DIA. Um, and through DIA, lots of global deployments everywhere from the Aleutian Islands to Iraq and the Balkans and every place in between. Um, and then moved over to combatant command work, policy, foreign and international engagement and policy, attache work, liaison, <laughs> and then all of that overseas for the last 13 years. Uh, and then back into academia, ending up at the War College uh, before leaving government. Uh, then I did a couple of years at Raytheon uh, as a cyber manager there. And then just recently was pulled back into DIA as uh, to support the development of some of their toys and contracts under a khaki contract as the DIA account executive. So in a very short run, that that's that's my 27 year career right there in a nutshell. So my touching on the cyber was all accidental. It, it wasn't intended. So the intelligence community is an is an information agency a community i guess that's what they that's what they sell that's their widget is they take information refine it down into finished intelligence and provide that to decision makers to make it very very simple so the movement of information across their own webs and communication networks at that time was information assurance cyber wasn't even the word that was used back then or information security uh, it was it was uh, it was a piece of hardware and a lot of IT and some security about hiding your passwords and changing it and kind of morphed and grew. But you had to incorporate that every time you were moving information. So if I was in the field and pushing information back stateside, it was something that was considered. Well, how are we going to move this information? So the intelligence community operates at three levels of classification. So whenever we uh, whenever we were developing an office whether it was overt or covert in a hotel room, um, a combatant command, a military, we had three separate worldwide webs, if you would. We had an unclassified web, we had a secret web, and then we had a top secret web. So, you know, the internet times three. And each one of them had their own regulations uh, from you couldn't put one computer terminal within 22 inches of another computer terminal. And you never thought about any of this. It was more of a pain in the butt. Like, how do I set this up so I can take this information and send it back? And you never realized what we were working on at that time during the construction and building and, and facilitating and moving was the birth of cyber, was protecting our information. How do we keep our uh, our networks free from invaders. How do we keep the information stored? At that time, there wasn't a cloud. It was usually on hard drives or someplace back in the fort or some salt mine. So how do we keep that, that secure? And as it grew and as technology increased, so did the threats. And with that, policy changed, physical policy changed. IT morphed into a kind of a quasi-cyber as well. 
And we had to start looking at things in multi-domains, multi-threats, and our adversaries, of course, looked at it as well. So um, cyber just happened. And that was that that was how I kind of fell into it. So in the government, as I mentioned, cyber is is, is kind of a part technical, part education, uh, and uh and a lot of information assurances of protecting that. And in my time in the government, that was my piece of, of cyber. In academia, when I moved back to the War College, the students that were there, it was planning, operational planning. It was using cyber as an offensive or defensive weapon. It was uh, denial and deception. It was campaign planning. It was, you know, the big question was, why can't we use cyber weapons here? Well, OK, it's kind of falls into Stratcom, which is the same as putting a nukes. And we have to be careful because we may fry out a system that one of our allies are using. And it's the policies, as you were mentioning, the policies and laws get really fuzzy then. so. Teaching that in an academic sense was wonderful because you could really think. And when you have your foreign partners there, which was the best, they started saying and adding and contributing what they thought about cybersecurity and us using cyber weapons or manipulating certain things and how that would affect or could affect them, that being the case. And now in industry, industry kind of has two parts. Either industry provides government with, uh, with personnel or toys to do their, their consistent work. Like, for example, DIA is probably about 30 to 40 percent uh, contract employers. And with that, a lot of companies provide uh, expertise in order to fill those particular ranks or provides a particular service or widgets for them to use in their area. And then the companies like for here, Raytheon in, in Portsmouth, it was a lot of research and development or development of certain platforms or other items. And with it, that there was an entire set of government policies uh, in order to safeguard and protect those and then rules and and uh, and roles and employment types that are specially designed to focus on uh, securing information systems, uh, communication systems, development systems, things along those lines. So those are kind of the three different areas and how I fell into it. And I hope I did not go over my time limit. <laughs> no, thank you. And I know I'll get back to you because we wanna know a little bit more about where some of the specific requirements the government or the intelligence services will be looking uh, for mm -hmm. if our students or participant want to pursue that as a career. But before I wanna turn to Juliana so that we can discuss some of the more traditional uh, path uh, more technical path to cybersecurity. You came to the United States actually to finish your engineering degree. You also became a software engineer. You and then enrolled in our South MBA program with a concentration in cybersecurity. And now you work for one of the largest defense contractors in the United States and have designed some of the most advanced technology in the US Navy. If you can't tell, I'm quite proud of Juliana and what she's already accomplished. But what made you decide to pursue a career first in engineering and computer science? And how early did you start studying programming, coding, the basics of computer science? And what was the link to cybersecurity then? Okay, thank you, um, first of all, for having me. Um, so I do want to say uh, deciding what you want to study is uh, really hard, especially when you're basically deciding what you want to do the rest of your life when you're just a teenager. Um, so if you don't have that figured out, that's totally okay. Um, but I actually, um, you know, when, you, when you're trying to decide, you have to know yourself. And I knew a few things about myself. I was sure about a few things. Um, one was that I loved math. Um, I've always loved math. Math was my favorite subject. Um, as long as I can remember. And I just remember um, at least being in my classes, um, I was one of the only ones that liked math. So I knew it was um, kind of a rare skill. So I wanted to do something with that. Um, I always loved problem solving and I loved understanding how things worked. Um, so I was that kid that like took things apart and um, figured out the mechanisms and how things worked in the background. Um, and lastly, I knew that I wanted to do something meaningful. And I always um, kind of admired technology because um, I just saw it as something that we used to make our lives easier. And when I was um, in high school, I was introduced to programming in one of my classes. And our teacher basically showed us that a computer does what you tell it to do. And that was 
brand new to me because I always just, you know, it didn't understand. I used the computer, but I didn't know how it did what it did. Um, and just knowing that I could program it to do whatever I wanted to do and that I could understand everything that happened um, in the background um, was just so interesting to me. So that was um, really what uh, started my interest in computer um, computer science or software engineering, whatever you want to call it. And um, I actually didn't, so I was introduced to C in high school. Um, so I did know a little bit of C. I knew algorithms. Um, I really loved al algorithms. It was linked to problem solving, um, but I didn't start programming until college, which is kind of rare um, because nowadays I think uh, people start programming on their own and by the time you get to college you already know um, at least the basics of programming uh, which was not the case for me I just knew the basics of C which is not really used anymore um, but it helped me understand the you know the basics of programming but when I graduated with my computer science degree um, in the US I began working in defense and that really sparked my interest in counterterrorism. I was working with the military. So, um, you know, going back to me wanting to do a meaningful work, I just always asked myself, what, um, how can I provide more value to my customer, which is the military? Um, so cybersecurity was really um, the way to go from that perspective. Thank you. Thanks. That's great. And, and I already have questions for you, uh, which I'll follow up with. But first, but last but not least, uh, Darwin, can you tell us a little bit more what inspired you to study cybersecurity, both in college and grad school? I remember you were already taking classes when you weren't even supposed to take those classes. You were ahead of the curve. And when there weren't opportunities, you created them, whether it was uh, creating a cybersecurity club at Salve, forcing me to bring you in as an intern, which was the best decision I've ever made, um, and then deciding to pursue a career in this field. And can you also touch on the role the internships played in that? Because again, I know you had so many internships in the last two years of your um, time at Salve, and, and how that really played a role in your current job at Johnson & Johnson, but also in guiding your future aspirations. And also, why did you decide at that time, before any company had asked you to, to pursue additional certification? Why did that serve to augment your education in cybersecurity? Absolutely, yeah. So, so uh, first and foremost, I wanted to say thank you uh, to yourself, Teresa and Jim Lutis, and, and the folks who work behind the scenes to make these events uh, happen, especially during COVID-19, which is, is such a uh, crazy time. And, and so this has certainly helps things feel normal again, having these cybersecurity events. So, so thank you to you guys and your team, uh, Francesca. So how did I get my start in cybersecurity, especially uh, as it pertains to while I was in school at Salve Regina University? I think for, for me, I, as Juliana had mentioned, it's okay if you don't know exactly what you want to do your first or second year uh, in college. And so for me, I started out as a biology major in my first semester. I figured out that that was that was, certainly wasn't something that I wanted to do. It wasn't as lucrative. Uh, and then I, I, I went and uh, did political science uh, my second semester. And so that, that's where I found out I had a knack for like Homeland Security and more specifically the intelligence and cybersecurity and counter to counter terrorism aspects of it. Uh, my, so I, I did three internships my freshman year uh, with political campaigns. And then I did one with Travelers Insurance. I was just trying to get a better lay of the land of uh, corporate America. What do I like to do? Where do I see myself fitting in? And within my internship at, at Travelers Insurance, which is a Fortune 500 company, I got to know more about like fraud investigations and digital forensics and how uh, these organizations really deploy um, different uh, technical skill sets to go ahead and pinpoint fraud and save themselves money in the long run. Uh, my sophomore year, I, I had I continued to hear about the cybersecurity courses that were offered at the grad level within Salve Regina. So within the Homeland Security Master's program, there's a cybersecurity concentrations where you can take things like digital forensics, mobile forensics, uh, 
uh, counterterrorism and intelligence. Uh, there's also uh, later on, uh, I took a course on artificial intelligence and national security, which was extremely captivating. And it, there's some things that I still employ now in my career from those courses. So those were really interesting courses and they just uh, really, really gripped me. And so I became obsessed with, with cybersecurity, which led me to uh, attend every single event that Pell Center had and go and network, put myself out there and, and just talk and reach out to folks and learn more about what they're doing in, in their careers. And so networking certainly played a key role in my career. Um, and so as the years progressed, I, I interned, I kept nagging uh, Francesca for an internship just so I could like just watch over her shoulder and she, see what her day to day was like. Uh, finally, I got an internship with her and learned a ton. I also interned with uh, Security Weekly, which is a podcast here in Rhode Island. They've been running since 2005 and interned with Ford Motors as a red team intern, uh, hacking uh, anything from drones to webcams to any of their public facing websites, whether it be in India or here in the United States and hacking uh, key fobs, right? So intercepting key fob signals. And today I'm in the uh, product security team at Johnson & Johnson. Uh, focusing on, on next generation medical devices, which is uh, robotic surgery, which is certainly, I, I think, the, the new uh, the new front when it comes to to medical care. And so that's going to be interesting. I can't share much, but uh, I think within the next year, there'll be some some major releases and you guys will get uh, to hear more about it. So when it comes to, to the importance of the internships, I, I did mention that I did uh, seven internships. For me, it was more so just trying to get a better idea of where I want to be after I graduate, because internships are, are fairly lo a short term compared to your first uh, first role, right? So internships are usually about three to six months. And so you could skip uh, skip around without having that stigma of you bouncing from job to job because you're just an intern. And so I took it upon myself to see it as like an opportunity, just uh, get get knowledge, get skills, build my network while also making money and, and not just wasting my summers like on the beach in Newport, which is, is super nice. Uh, but you certainly want to squeeze as, as much juice as you can of your time, especially while you're young and, and getting into your career. So that's what I, what I did. And so when it comes to certifications, I, I currently hold the Security Plus, the AWS CCP, the Azure 900, uh, the CCSFP, which is uh, High Trust uh, Common Security Framework for uh, the healthcare industry in, encapsulates HIPAA, NIST, ISO. Um, I, I think I'm leaving one off there, but for me, it, it's more so just continuing that that hunt for knowledge, right? Cybersecurity is an ever changing landscape. Uh, it, it, you could you could try and go and take a sabbatical uh, for three months and not work at a job for three months. You'll come back into a cybersecurity role or any tech role. And everything is brand new. And I think one thing that COVID has done is really sped up the inevitable, which is folks working remote and working from home. And so now everything is super intensified. So the last point that I would like to make is I can't really think of many other uh, careers that are more future proof than cybersecurity. Right. So with with the pandemic, we've seen a lot of folks being displaced from their jobs. And when we're talking about who is still working, who, which which industries have excelled during the pandemic, we're looking at artificial intelligence so that companies can make uh, better decisions and more intelligent decisions based on their uh, data sets. Big data has also uh, been blowing up. And then cybersecurity, because you need to secure the entire infrastructure, which everybody is working on from home. So if you're, if you're thinking about cybersecurity, I certainly encourage you to do so and, uh, yeah, it's I can't think of a more future proof career and I'm happy I, I did go down the route. So. Thank you, Darwin. You're so inspiring. I'm inspired by you and in all. And just to um, follow up on what you just said, there are currently over 500,000 jobs opened in the United States alone in cybersecurity. There are over 4.2 million unfulfilled jobs around the world. Microsoft just came up with some new research last week showing that this trend is only going to grow, and we're talking about in the millions. Um, so absolutely. And Professor Wan, if I can follow up actually on the thread on the certification front, what are some of the specific certification that students might need to have in order to pursue a career in government, intelligence service, but mostly uh, in the private sector serving 
the Department of Defense as a contractor, um, like Juliana is doing? What are some of the specific certification that might be needed? And what are some of the other skills that they should be thinking about now if they want to pursue that kind of career, not in the sure. private sector, but working for government? I think the most important thing that Juliana said, and I want to stress this again, is is kind of knowing where you want to go. And it's okay to not know because there's so much to learn. And um, again, um, when Darwin talked about uh, interns, and I'll cover that and say, there's nothing more important than interns when it comes down to applying for a job, more so almost than the certifications. Um, so if you're coming out of college and you're you're going through the process, say cybersecurity is for me, and you're not really sure which way to go. You don't have to be into math. I, I chose political science because it didn't have a math requirement in college. And that was uh, that's kind of how I wound up studying that element. But you don't have to be that technical to go into that field. And there's a lot uh, of broad fields. I'm going to focus in um, on what you just said before about a defense contractor, since it seems to be one of the closest and easier entry level positions. So uh, taking a going back to my time at Raytheon, where I was consistently hiring, I, I mean, it was each about every six months, I was hiring 18 plus uh, individuals coming into the cyber world. And we had different types of core jobs to safeguard the research and development networks of a defense contractor. And this is not just Raytheon, this is every defense contractor, anybody that works within the government or connects and ties to the government falls under certain regulations. Uh, the overseeing body, we used to be called DSS, Defense Security Services. Now it's Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency, DCSA. And all of their certifications and regulations and education and training are on their website. They're very, very open about that. And there's a process called RMF, Risk, risk Management Framework. It is, it's it's painful, but it's, it's kind of a self-guiding way to ensure that developers and architects who are building something consider and think about the safeguards of not only their networks, but their physical space and, and so on and so forth. And there is a cadre of employees that are hired under that called ISOs and ISMs, Information System Security Officers and Information System Security Managers uh, that are hired to uh, ensure that that work is done, which means that the, um, the project can go forward with the government permission. And the projects cannot move unless these positions are filled and they work with it. So that's why they're so critical and there's so many of them. The certifications need what I like to see as a hiring official is I'm going to look at I'm going to look for the 85 was it the 8570s, which is the uh, security plus is a baseline. That is the, the core element that you have to have. And I think Salve does teach the the uh, all of that up until the test. So taking the security plus is key for any of those jobs. It is the baseline core element. Um, when you get into the CASP or the CISM, there's a lot more certifications and they grow consistently, but the Security Plus is pretty much the gold standard as the entry level and the start that you have to have. If you don't have experience with things like Linux, Unix, um, get it. And, and it doesn't have to be certifications or just explore with it. Talk to your professor, say, do you have experience on, you know, how do I get more experience on Windows and Unix and Linux? So that you can put that on your resume and say, I have experience with it. I'm not gonna ask for certification. I just wanna know that when I ask you about it, you know what it is that I'm talking about as an operating system because we'll teach you everything coming in. So with a baseline certification, with an understanding of particular computer networks that you know are going to be on there, and with an internship, which is the most important thing when you're in school, please don't waste your summer. And I think Darwin, you hit it the best. It's so tempting to just sit on the beach and drink here. Um, but if you if you just work your way towards an internship, it gives you work experience. So you're not just saying, hey, I graduated, I took this class. You're saying, I work here and I can speak these computer languages and I have this certification and I'm willing to start tomorrow. And that type of person I'm gonna look at a little bit more. And the best way to get that, if you're unsure, if you're looking at a company like Johnson Johnson or Raytheon or Lockheed or, or Boeing or, or, or any other company, look at the job advertisements and look at what it says, minimum required. And when you start there, it says, must have knowledge of Linux, Unix, must know what Red Hat is, and then there'll be a list. Don't just take those as optional. Find out what they are and make sure that you can put knowledge down on your resume that addresses each one of those. 
And Professor Wen, if I can just follow up on that, actually, you, I know you've helped many students and continue to do so apply for a cybersecurity job or figuring out how to even uh, pursue an application or interview. What are some of the other tips that you can share on how to write an effective resume um, and what are maybe some of the common mistakes you've seen? So to be more practical, uh, when students come to you, and be like, Professor Wen, can you help me with this? Okay, I'm taking an extra sip of coffee to fit an hour into this next five minutes. Um, first off, let me open up my, I don't know if, if you're going to put my email out, but anybody, please feel free to reach out to me. This is, uh, I'm, I'm here to help the Salvi community and anyone on here. Um, one of the issues that I ran into in a class, and I'll tell a small story, but, but by answering the question as well, I had a student have me look over the resume as they were applying for a position uh, at Lockheed. It was the first one I had looked at from Salve when I began teaching there. And when I looked at it, it was well put together. It looked nice. It had lots of pretty lines on there, but it was all academic heavy up front. And after two months of having the student in the class, I knew that he was doing an internship with the Navy at the Navy Underwater Warfare Center. I knew he had a security clearance. I knew some of the work that he was doing, and yet none of it was on the resume. And wherever he received his guidance from, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't negative to the person who provided guidance but it seemed that the resume wasn't shaped for a, a, either a government or a contracting position. So the government works very weird and some companies, depending upon the size, uh, use multiple layers of, of editing before it gets to a hiring official, before I can even see it. So when you put together a resume, sometimes you have to take the information and put it and upload it, cut and paste into boxes. And a, re and a computer scans it, they look for keywords, they look for elements, so the first thing you're dealing with a, is the computer. Then it goes to a, a human resource or a talent acquisition branch. I'm not knocking that particular organization, but those people have no idea of the job that you're looking for. They're not tied. They don't even know who I am. My talent acquisitions were in, I think they were in New Mexico, and they had absolutely no idea what I was doing here in Portsmouth, what I was looking for, technology, nothing. They they were sending me people that, you know, were pipe fitters. And I'm like, what is this? Well, I have the keywords on here in the last job. Um, so they don't know. They're looking for the keywords and they they push something over. And then it gets to the hiring official, hopefully. When the hiring official gets it, if that hiring official gets a stack, they're going to, and this is human nature, and you can go into psychology or anything, they're going to look at that resume for a couple seconds. And they're going to put it into one file, either no, or they're going to, one file, yes, I'm going to look at that. And out of that one, yes, I'm going to look at that, they're going to take the top three to five and interview. So that's your playing field. So when you're putting your resume together, it is an information operation. It is literally, you are not just putting together a resume saying, I'm putting together these sentences. The worst thing you can do is bullet yourself to one or two sentences because the person who writes, you know, a paragraph, three paragraphs for their current job description or their internship says, this is all the stuff that I did as a hiring official. I'm going to look at it and say, God, they did this, they did this, they did this. And that student who talked to me never had the key elements on the resume. So to sum this up, how I like to see a resume, the most effective ones that I've seen make themselves through is on a standard piece of paper, so I can put this thing up there on the top, you have your name. And then if you can, put an executive summary. And an executive summary, this is going to be not the I'm looking for, say, you know, I'm a growing professional with experience and dot, 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 dot. What this is doing is it is not only helping with the computer search, but when you get to that talent acquisition person and they're only going to read the first sentence, if they read only the first sentence, they're going to send it forward. So you want to put all your cards abridged in that top paragraph. Next is going to be if you have a security clearance or a foreign language, especially if you're going into the intelligence community, that's where you put it. Next is going to be your tools. Remember I mentioned before about Red Hat and uh, Unix, Linux, put your tools there because those are going to be in the job. Then your work experience is that is in the order that we rank and stack. And then you have your education and so on, everything afterwards. Because if you don't have the education, I'm not even going to see the resume. So that's why it's moved to the back. It's it's a, it's a minimum requirement to have a bachelor's for some of these positions. So I'm more than happy to work with anyone who reaches out to me to guide, instruct, and to help them. Because there's so many different fields, whether it's in the private sector, and there's a lot of different fields in the private sector, and even within the government, there's 
Department of Energy is going to look at things entirely different from a combatant command from an intelligence agency from uh, a different um, think tank someplace. So you customize each and every resume based upon your target set, and you think about it as an information operation with the goal, get yourself in front of the hiring official, and then you sell your personality and your knowledge. And that's that's kind of... That's where my passion is right now with Salve is I know everyone's in, in school to get to another job and I teach them as much as I can and guide them and, and show them all the different things that are potentially out there and they choose their own direction. But how to encapsulate that and put that onto a resume, I think is the greatest piece to pull out of their last year that they have with me there. So I hope that I was able to capture that in a short period of time and that my caffeine didn't blur all together there. No, thank you. Your students are so lucky to have you. And in fact, please um, put your e email um, into the chat box, which is already many people have asked for. Um, ah. And actually, so many questions have come in in the meantime. Before I move on to my next question, um, uh, Darwin, one for you that um, I know might not be easy to answer, but how long did you spend in each of the, your internships? Um, I, I mean, I know the answer because you've had so many, but you know you know where probably where they're trying to get to yeah absolutely so uh for me the average internship was three to six months and i did have two that turned into more uh long-term support roles so with yourself with the cyber leadership project i did uh turn from a uh, internship uh, in one year and then i came back the next year as, as more of a support and associate and then with security weekly the, the cyber security podcast I did my three months. They were really happy with with the work that I was doing, and so they uh, made me a a full time uh, employee there, or more so like a, a part time associate. And, and so that was certainly looks good on the on the resume that you're going from an intern up a, to to an associate level. So the average internship is just a summer, three months, and then there's something that's called a co op, which may require you to take time off from school, and that is usually six months. So thank you so much. And now, Juliana, I want to turn it back to you as the other woman on this panel, because we have talked about how wonderful it is to work on cybersecurity. But let's also be honest, there are a lot of issues, uh, a lot of challenges. This is still very much a male-dominated field. So how did you um, overcome some of those challenges, especially in some of the specific jobs and assignments that you had where you were often the only woman in that field and now as a new mom in this field as well? Yeah, so I mean, the challenges really started in school because, um, as Francesca mentioned, I grew up in Argentina and that's where I started my degree. And um, I'm sure Italy is pretty similar, but it's a very traditional society. Um, women are expected to go into very traditional careers. Um, psychology, accounting, teaching, that's like you know, 90% of women. So just by going into engineering, um, I was already, you know, getting comments and stuff. And um, when I started my degree, I was really just dealing with teachers, um, you know, in their 50s, 60s, who legitimately believe that I didn't belong in the room. And um, that's gonna happen in, um, in, at work as well. So, you know, from the beginning, I just felt like I always had to prove that I did belong there. Um, so I always uh, tried to, first of all, I love a challenge. And um, so that just kept me challenged all the time. I felt like I had to work harder. I was really a target for like being called on the whiteboard. Uh, so I had to really know my material and that made me a better student and it made me a better professional when it, you know, when I found the same challenges at work. Um, so most of my teams, I'm still, I'm still the only, the only woman. And even though, um, it's it's a great environment to work in. Um, I've always just dealt with it, you know, with professionalism and just um, working extra hard to prove myself. And one of the things you mentioned, so I, when it comes to assignments, I actually um, did some assi travel assignments and stuff and where I was working really close with the 
our military and our customers. And a lot of times I had to put up with a lot of cursing. Um, just they're just used to working with all guys. So you have to be super professional to deal with those things. And specifically um, about uh, you, it's software. So when you're dealing with software managers, a lot of times they're used to the you know typical software engineer who um, is very shy and just you know it's not interested in um, being promoted it's they're just there to do their job so that was one of the challenges that i face is that sometimes managers assume the same thing about you so it's very important to be able to communicate what you desire for your career and um, make sure that your manager is aware of that and that you don't just um, you know, get thrown into the bag with what everyone else may want. So um, that I would say that's that's a big challenge when it comes to uh, women in uh, in software because we tend to be more driven. <laughs> that's fine. Thank you so much for sharing that. That must not be easy. And I completely agree with you. First of all, on the point of being the best prepared person in the room is often what has helped me in the field, especially when I was younger, um, just at my age, used to be, oh, where is your boss coming? You you published that study? How's that possible? So being the first the prepared person in the room was definitely, um, and, and one of the things that helped me, but also having soft skills, like you said, so it's not just the hardcore skills. Now, uh, Darwin, and, and to all of you really, but uh, we discussed how we have these huge gap and growing gap between the demand for more cybersecurity talent and the supply of cybersecurity professional. And clearly we cannot close that gap to equilibrium without more, more women, but also more minorities and people with different backgrounds. So Darwin, if you could please speak to how can we encourage people in minority groups to see cybersecurity, first of all, as an interesting field of study, and then as an attractive, rewarding career path, and what is the role in, of mentors and having role models to look up to? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think uh, this is a very important topic and one that's closely uh, near and dear to my heart, certainly, because uh, growing up inner city and not uh, being afforded the same opportunities as some of my some of my peers that I went to Salve with, it, I felt like I did have to fight for that extra inch. And similar to Juliana, uh, as a woman in the tech field, right, it, it's like you always have to strive for that um, perfectionism or, or that excellence in ensuring that you're always uh, on point. And so I think for me, when it comes to to encouraging uh, minorities and women uh, to get into cybersecurity, I think the earlier you get them, the better. So whether that's in middle school and high school engagements as well. And I know that uh, Salve and the Pell Center does welcome students from Rogers. And I've also done some work in my local community and I've spoken at Rhode Island College to, to, to middle school students and high school students. So that's where you really want to capture them. And I think the way that you pitch it to them is that you can do cybersecurity for a Mercedes Benz or uh, luxury brands also need cybersecurity. So your Gucci's, your Louis Vuitton's, also NASA, which is, uh, an extremely uh, lucrative, or it may seem that way at least, uh, position. They also need cybersecurity. Everybody needs cybersecurity. So if you're interested in a field, whether it's like, let's say biology as well, right now the COVID-19 vaccine, they have very heavy security um, controls around it at J&J. &J. And so it doesn't matter what your interest is in, all industries need cybersecurity. So that's one way you pitch it. The other way you pitch it as well is that you're probably going to you're very likely going to be making six figures uh, within the first five years of your career. And so there are not many other career fields where you can say that, right? You could go be a technical writer. You're not making uh, 100, like six figures within your first five years. There's not many industries. So that's, that's another way that you uh, pitch it to them. And then on the point of mentorship, I don't think I would be where I'm at without the mentorship uh, that I've received. And so that's why I think that internships are very important. So through the mentorship that I, that I received from folks like Francesca and, and Paul at Security Weekly and many of my different uh, internships, I've been able to kind of um, sharpen and polish myself so that I, when I step into the corporate environment, I know how to maneuver and how to act. So I think emotional intelligence is one thing that you're able to glean uh, from your, your, your mentors, but also uh like if you can stand on the shoulders of giants then you can see much further and avoid mistakes that they may have committed in their in their careers right and so it, it, like just just there's folks on this call that you could certainly reach out to you can reach out to me juliana barrett or francesca ask questions 
Uh, what are some mistakes you may have uh, wanted to avoid or something you regret? Um, for me, I, I don't have any regrets, just things that, you know, that I would learn from and apply uh, better moving forward. And so one thing that I would like to ask of folks is uh, right now I, I am mentoring uh, several students with, with at Salve. Um, and I, one thing that I always ask of them is for them to help those behind them as well. Uh, once you receive that mentorship, do not be greedy. Do not close the door on the folks behind you. Uh, provide that mentorship back. And so I think that's the way that you would pitch it to, to students in middle school and high school. And then the, the importance of that mentorship plays. Yeah. Completely agree. Thanks. I couldn't have said it better. Um, Professor Wan, if I can come back to you, because there's a lot of questions coming in. So I want to make sure that we have time for them. What are some of the advice you have for the non traditional um, students that don't have a traditional path uh, that we have discussed with Juliana and Darwin, perhaps? What can they do about internship? What can they get the experience needed to put on that resume? Um, what else can they do outside of their current field, perhaps? if they're ready um, to enter cybersecurity still. Well, okay, this is where it gets fun because this is, you know, you, you look back and this is this is when my students, after about a month or so, they know how to derail me from the lesson and we spend three hours and go off on an entirely different tangent where something else happens and we start discussing it because I loved my career and it, it, I would do it almost the same or different. There's a million different ways, but it was so much fun. And it, and it wasn't just, um, it wasn't just the cyber piece of it, because again, I, I didn't intend to have a piece of cyber security or, or not. It wasn't just cyber security. Cyber security is the defensive piece of it. There, there's a there's a lot of fun stuff out there with the cyber that is not necessarily uh, just making sure that a door is locked and the computer is locked. Down. There is a ton of offensive and planning and there are. Um, I think someone was mentioned red teaming beforehand, Darwin, were, were you mentioning about red teaming and digging? Oh my God, there's a whole bunch of reverse engineering and companies that, you know, we'll steal something from an adversary and pull it apart and find out what it can do and then test it a million different ways. And that's sometimes how we develop some of our defensive capabilities. That has nothing to do with, with O's and, you know, zeros and ones and computers. This has to do with, with uh, mechanics and engineering and, but it is a piece of, this cybersecurity world that we live in. And there's, um, God, for the non-traditional items, in cybersecurity, as I mentioned before, you have, the, you know, you have the IT piece of it, you have the physical piece of it, and then you have the policy piece of it. And each one of those has different agencies and then suddenly you can, you can almost drill down. It's a very hard question to ask, but um, planning is a big piece. If you're not going into the the traditional information system security officer and go into that particular road understanding how planning works so and i'm just working in the defense department so we have an entirely new combatant command called the united states cybercom and in this cybercom it's it's not all people just you know protecting computers there are there are planners there's personnel there's uh, there's short term plans that's which is called the J3 long term planning called the J5 J2 is the intelligence uh, piece to that um and then you have other elements then you have the international group where you're doing international engagement and liaison where you're pulling in parts of the British like GCHQ because that's their NSA and how are they doing security and how does it mesh and meld with uh with um with our DODs I was in NSA back in the 90s, I was probably one of five extroverts that worked in that agency. So they sent me overseas to talk to our foreign partners because the running joke was, how do you tell an, uh, you know, a, a, uh, you know, an NSA extrovert, they stare at your shoes. So yeah, as you can tell, I'm a hyper A type personality. So the careers are not defined and you could be almost anything. Now, getting that onto a resume to apply for a job within the cyber field. Well, you may not apply directly to the cyber field, but you may apply to the cyber agency or the cyber office. So it's, as I mentioned, cybercom. You may not be doing cyber, but you're part of the command that's working, so you're gonna understand it. If you work for the car company, it doesn't mean you're making a car. You can do business development, you can do engineering, you can do marketing, you could do you know advertising. So there is a there's a a, a vast uh, amount of deal for for a specifics. I would say reach out to me, I, and I will help anybody and guide them in that particular direction. Um, but interns, and again, I'll, I'll round this out. Darwin hit it. The intern is the most important. It's where you're going to get your first job experience. And it doesn't matter what it is. 
because what an employer looks at, they're going to say, this person works. They have experience in X, Y, Z. You don't have to have experience in that field that you're applying for. You just have to have some of the, the baseline tenets to say this person is capable of coming in here and we're going to mold them into that job and build their career. So you, when you apply for a job, you're not, you have to understand you're not an expert in that job. You rarely know anything about that job. You become an expert in that job. And when you become an expert, that's when you leave it and go to another job. And as Darwin says, you mentor the next group coming in to make sure that they backfill behind you. So it's this, it's this life cycle that, that, that comes around. Now for internships, I know Salve has a program that works on internships locally. When I went through school, um, I, I did not have the pleasure of going to Salve. At that time, I was a man, so I wasn't allowed to go to Salve. But I was down in New Jersey, and they had. Uh, I went to this place called the Washington Center, which was, it's a, um, it's a clearinghouse. If it's an accredited university in the United States, it has a, an ability there. Salve would be. Uh, it would work with Salve. You would. You would go down. Uh, God, I, I really don't want to speak for this this particular office, but what they because I, I would probably get it wrong after I don't want to say how many years it's been, but it was a way that I was able to facilitate an internship in Washington um, and also get college credit. So when my when I was ready to apply, I was able to check all those boxes and I, I you sacrifice a lot of fun times, but the end is a, is a, the, the most amazing rewarding career that you could possibly ask for. And it's so diverse, uh, not only globally, but also the work wise and it's satisfying. And I think that's a key thing. You want to be happy in what you do. And it's one way you're not stuck in one particular job for the rest of your life. And that's and this is again, I don't I hate to keep referencing you on this thing. But as I mentioned before, three months later, it's different. So it's going to change constantly. Uh, it, and and that's that's kind of the truth of it. So I'll I'll end there. And Darwin, uh, go ahead with your comment. And in the meantime, while you're at it, and also answer another question that just came in. And it says, um, everybody thinks that most cybersecurity jobs are sitting behind a computer all day. So have you sat behind a computer all day in all of the jobs and internship you've had? Uh, so I, I would say yes. Um, I, I won't sugarcoat it because most of my roles have been technical. And so whether it was working in a lab uh, with peers, working on, on uh, breaking a box or just trying to pick apart uh, this one drone or this one piece of uh, reverse engineer, this one piece of, of malware, uh, we were in a lab on a computer. But there, there have been instances where we went like dumpster diving um, and looking for uh, spare computers that, uh, that that organization that Ford Motors may have thrown away so that we could leverage it for our testing. Uh, I know that there's also penetration testing engagements where you have to go on site um, and actually try and break uh, break into your client's building physically. Uh, there's lock picking. There's there's a lot. Of, there's a physical aspect to cybersecurity. Uh, I, I would say the majority of it is in front of a computer, though, since it, it mostly deals with uh, the cyber realm. Uh, one thing that I did want to add to what Barrett was saying, though, to the question that Francesca asked Barrett is that. Uh, with mentorship and networking opportunities, you should leverage the power of LinkedIn. And so if I were to give uh, everybody on the call some homework is if you don't have a LinkedIn, go create one. And if you do have a LinkedIn, look up cybersecurity roles and see how you line up with the skills and qualifications that are there and then just work towards it. Uh, so that, that's all for me. And then also uh, uh, on something that Juliana said that I wanted to touch on is that uh, working as a woman uh, in security or in tech can be intimidating at, at some times, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, some organizations place a huge emphasis on being extremely welcoming to women and minorities. So I know that at Johnson & Johnson, my director, uh, well, my CISO is a woman. My director of the product security team is a woman. The majority of the people on my team are women. And so it, it's an it's extremely welcoming, welcoming environment. And so look for those organizations because you are going to spend a, a good amount of time and a good amount of your career uh, within an organization, whether it's one year or, or five years, it's still a significant amount of time. So, so do your due diligence on the organization you will join. So I think those are my parting, parting uh, thoughts. And if there's any questions, certainly happy to. I'll post my uh, email in the comments so anybody wants to reach out to me. 
Thank you. And just to answer also to the question about sitting in front of a computer, as a professor, advisor, consultant, and researcher in the field, I actually, pre-COVID, spend half of my time not in front of a computer, but engaging with senior leaders around the world, whether it was advising, again, our governor in Rhode Island, our congressional delegation, um, in my consulting job, boards of directors. I actually spend a lot of time talking to people and that's why all of those previous experience i had that i mentioned at the beginning of our webinar were extremely useful because i had to learn to translate very technical issues into policy terms into governance into business terms so that i could talk to non-technical people that nonetheless were the ones that were going to make the decision on budget hiring policy strategy so there are plenty of careers within the cybersecurity field that don't require you to be behind a keyboard all day. Now, unfortunately, so I do, but that's because we are using most of these um, tools to communicate, but I continue to have a lot of conversation with human beings and I have to continue to learn how to translate, how to be an interpreter for very technical issues into the policy, governance and business world. Um, I, we are at the top of the hour, so I wanna be mindful for those who have to get off, but we will continue for another five, 10 minutes because there are more questions that have come in. For, so for those of you who can stay, please stay and we'll try to get to all your questions. Um, so so, uh, Professor Wan, if I can get back to you again. So we don't only have um, young students on our webinar today. We have about 80 people signed up, including um, people that are thinking about transitioning their mid-level career. We have veterans, we have police officers, and those people might be wondering what can they do with the experience that they've gained in the police or military, for example, in the training, investigation, hiring, and how could these uh, skills uh, fit into cyber? Well, uh, speaking of the intelligence community, I, I've had, th there's an enormous amount of law enforcement that we have within the classroom. And their experience is identical to that that we do in the intelligence community. So it's, you know, if they're a detective trying to solve a crime, we're in the same exact boat. We're, we're looking to, um, we're looking to find out either who did it, who's about to do it, or get an indication and a warning. It's all, it's all research and filling in information gaps in order to get a whole picture to make a decision. And that's where cyber becomes a tool. So that's why I have all these different, you know, 17 different intelligence agencies. Each one of them has a specific niche. Each one has a specific culture. Um, each one is tasked to do something entirely different. So when you are, if cyber is a particular element that could help fill the gap, then you will use cyber or an element of cyber in order to get that. And there's a lot of different ints. There's Mazins and SIGIN and so on and so forth. And each one has different. And, and I need a giant whiteboard in order to expand. Um, but the experience that anybody has, especially in the services, the services translate depending upon what your MOS is, uh, where you've worked. Uh, the benefit about being in DOD and transferring into the civilian DOD world, and this excludes CIA, because CIA and FBI have different retirement plans, because everything you have to have to, there's more to it than just the job, because the salary does play a piece of it. So uh, if you're transferring from uh, a, a service into one of the DOD agencies, it's wonderful because you're, the continuance of your your time in leading to your pension almost is unchanged. You can you can do a buy in, and that's that's sometimes is very important for someone who only did ten years of military service, but they would like to have a 20, 30 year uh, pension, and and that can carry over. That's a that's a very large piece of it. Um, as far as with uh, with law enforcement, law enforcement and the services share a common discipline. Uh, in not only report writing, but uh, analysis, the way they view things um, and their um, their work ethic. And it is something that is looked at and admired because a lot of, again, the tenets of depending upon what your MOS is and depending upon what your, for those who don't know, MOS is your job description in, in DOD, um, in the services and in law enforcement, depending upon what you're doing, even, a, even a, just a straight law enforcement officer who drives around has certain tenets that are valuable going into uh, into Department of Defense. Now, the one element I can say when we talked about having an internship, you have an internship and a job. It may not be to cyber, but your end goal in your career may be to work in the cyber field. Well, 
if you don't have anything in your resume that that leads to cyber, but you know that that's something that you're interested in as you learn about the, the vast diversity of jobs and disciplines there is within cyber, I've always stressed Department of Defense as, as an excellent institution to find your way through there. It's a um, it's welcoming. I, I don't. Know. It's a, it's a it's the largest government, our largest U.S. employer. DoD is enormous from everything from mail services to to, to flying planes, um, but they encourage you change your job every 24 to 36 months. It's almost mandated to move up. This way, you're not stovepiped in one particular understanding. They expect you at a certain field to have multiple jobs so that you can speak very broadly upon something. So if you enter. Let's say if you're coming in as law enforcement and you enter the job or you apply to a, uh, be a counterintelligence officer, a polygraph examiner, something that falls in a very, very similar field as law enforcement, that your resume is going to kind of go right on that. And you get your foot in the door into the Department of Defense and, and Department of Defense agencies are massive. And that's National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, National Security Agency, Defense Intelligence Agency and Defense Intelligence Agency has uh the responsibility of all the intelligence directorates at the combatant commands that's tens of thousands of job openings that are there i'm just pointing that out so this is not just a agency if you get into that particular dod world you can then navigate and find out what you like and that's when it goes back it doesn't matter how old you are as darren was saying your mentor i've had i have mentors now that are our seniors on there. It is, it's you always, there's always gonna be someone above you. There's always gonna be someone you have to report to that signs your paychecks. It doesn't matter what scale or level you're at. And those people will help guide you. Say, well, I, I'm in this particular field. How do I get here? Well, you know what? I know this person over here. Let, let's reach out and set up a meeting and find out. And then you find out what skills you need to start developing. And I speak very highly of DOD coming from it because they, they will provide you with that education and that internal training in order to fulfill those movements. So I hope that I answered that in a, in a, in a way. Again, it's, it's one of those things where I need to speak one on one specifically to a person because everyone's field is different. But DOD is very, um, is very welcoming to give you that type of training and education to diversify in there. Well, don't worry, because I'm sure you're going to get a lot of emails um, and <laughs> a lot of questions. But I could not finish the seminar without asking all of you, but in particular, Juliana, because of my experience you know, with you in the classroom and outside of the classroom, is what was the best part of your education at Salve? It's actually the place where you got the least technical of all your trainings. And since you've studied in other countries and other schools, what can you say that the, uh, the Salve education, training, the classroom helped you with. I know we were already ahead of the curve because we had to do your final um, and some of the work online because you were already traveling to wait on. We had to figure out how to use some of the tools. Now they've been normal, but three or four years ago was an exception. Um, so what would you say to those who are currently South students and they should be taking um, you know, most out of their education and their opportunities on campus or off campus right now? So one of the things that we already touched upon is um, the diversity of faculty members. Um, I think that really made me realize how wide the field is. Um, you know, sometimes you, as we mentioned, you go into cyber with for a particular reason. Mine was more, um, you know, the military background, counterterrorism, cyber operations, things like that. And then um, through my faculty, I realized that you could be a federal prosecutor, you could be doing cryptography, you could be um, in law enforcement, um, you could be a consultant, and there's so many possibilities. Um, so really um, networking with the faculty, learning from the faculty. And then I think the most important part was um, most of my classes were discussion based and the diversity of backgrounds that the students brought to the discussions uh, were just so valuable. I, you know, and that was one of the beauties of studying in Newport that we have the Naval War College right here. So we had um, students that were taking classes there, taking classes at Salve. Um, so a lot of military backgrounds, law enforcement backgrounds, um, and it just, every, I mean, I'm sure 
any teacher can say this, but every time they teach the class, it's completely different because the students are different. The discussion just leads to different things. And um, that was, you know, that was the beauty of it. Every time I walked into a class, um, there was just so much to learn and that's one of the reasons why I chose this program um, because of the diversity of classes that I could take and I could be there in person for the discussions as well as um, take them online if I needed to. And we still had discussions online um, that were certainly interesting. You know, no value was lost. So um, I that, that's what I would say. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Trying to do the best to continue to stimulate those discussion online while we have to be apart. Um, so, Professor Wan, just to conclude and, and to follow on what Juliana just said, what do you think it takes to take us out of the degree and turn into a career? What is your message to the people we still have online that are thinking about uh, pursuing a career in cybersecurity and maybe have not started yet with their cybersecurity classes? Well, as just mentioned before, the, 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 oh God. It's the drive, and I have to say that you know, teaching it. At, I, I was very honored to get the chance when I was brought over early to to speak at Salve, and I was I was very impressed at the student body. And I've spoken at several different universities and uh, and taught at the Naval War College, and I I I didn't think when I left the Naval War College teaching there, I I was under the false assumption that those were going to be the only motivated students. Uh, that I would ever see, and I was scared when I was going over to Salve, and because that was a, a, a first class lecture that I had, and I was I was fascinated how motivated the students were, how most of them already were pursuing interns, how they were driven uh, in order to follow up this career. It, it well, your question is almost answered by the students themselves, and from being in other universities, it just seems that uh, I felt more uh, comfortable in my classes at Salve because the students were so engaged and had such a drive in order to move forward. And, and again, it, yeah, I'm speaking for the home team and I work for Salve, but realistically it's it's where my my happy place is. So sitting in front of, of you know, 30 students that all of which have their hands up, they're motivated and they want to know, that that right there is your winning formula. So when you wake up in the morning and you go to class and you say, you know, this is what I have to do and it's fun. And yes, it's it's work. You enjoy what you're doing and you get the most out of your classes. And following what Juliana was saying, when you have the, your, your foreign students that are in the God, they provide so much because they provide a perspective that most American students don't get, which is, you know, how does how does Italy feel about what America is doing this thing? How does this country, how do the Brits look at this thing? You're getting something from a different perspective. And when you take advantage of all of these items, you won. You're already in that field. So the. I, I guess the well, I just see that the the students come already enriched with those questions, and that's 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 the motivation I see for my classes. Thank you. Um, if there's anything else that Juliana or Darwin want to add, otherwise we're going to let everybody go since we already kept them at fifteen extra minutes. Darwin, Juliana, um, I just want to wish everybody to stay healthy and safe. Go vote. Um, thank you again for taking the time to participate in this virtual seminar. Feel free to reach out to us. You should have all our email addresses on the chat. You can always email me or um, our wonderful people at the Pell Center, which I also want to thank uh, for continuing to engage in these extremely important discussions. We couldn't do any of this without our IT support, our communication support. Um, know that those are other resources you have on campus outside of the regular classrooms. Um, and thank you. Um, reach out also for ideas, uh, suggestions, because we we hope to host another seminars like this next semester. Um, we'll have same panelists, but we can expand it more, and maybe we'll have everybody on the screen, and so we can um, interact more. And probably will have to be a longer session. But with that, thank you again. Have a wonderful evening, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.